you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Today I'd like to introduce Guy Crichton. Guy's a show jumping specialist coach. He's ridden a lot in show jumping. He rode in the Montreal Olympics with Mr. Dennis, the Los Angeles Olympics with Conclusion, and now he spends a lot of time teaching younger riders and bringing on other show jumpers. How are you today, Guy? Very good, thank you. Good, good. Guy, we're going to start off by asking you your favourite inspirational quote. Just basically do it more than anything with our younger riders especially because that's the thing uh, show jumping wise if you're being serious enough to just do it okay and and when you say just do it do you think something's holding them back they just need you to say that for a bit of confidence the problem with our uh, newer form of go jumping in regarding height classes people have comfort spots and sometimes to improve they need to just be pushed a little past that comfort spot and then they find they can cope as good as gold. Okay, okay. So you as the coach are giving them that bit of confidence to just push outside their comfort zone. Great, great. Yes, to just push them up a little. Mm. The, the way it works is you push up a little in, in uh, show jumping in, then you come back, then you push up a little, and then they find they can cope. And, and once they've got the confidence to cope, then they're as good as gold. Good, good. Guy, tell me a little bit about you're starting with horses. Do you, have you got first memories of when you rode? Oh, yeah, very, very young. My older brother used to do a little bit back in those days with the hunting and a little bit of show jumping. I, for some reason, just was mad on the idea and um, left school and that's what I did. Okay. Had so, horses, went, went to shows and that was how I started. So when you went to shows as an income, did you – Go from show to show working on prize money? Is that how it worked? Because there wouldn't have been the coaching available that there is now. No, there was no coaching. Our basic, mm. um, I started off at Pony Club and basically our the th- show jumping theory those days was if you got from one side to the other side, you were a show jumper. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I have to say that I started off incorrectly because you copied the main uh, competitor at the time was Kevin Bacon who kicked legs and flew and carried on. And, and that's all we saw because he was doing all the winning. You thought that was the way to go, which was totally, totally wrong. Unfortunately, I spent hours and hours practicing it. And it was only later that then I decided instead of being just up on my little dunghill up here that I would go south and went to Adelaide and then Victoria where your your sort of more elite was and was lucky enough to get a gentleman by the name of Art Utendall that was a Dutch rider out here and he started me on the correct direction. I, I owe him everything. I've just got to interrupt here because I've got a quote from Art Newtondale and he actually said that Guy Crichton had the most wonderful eye and judgment of stride on any horse. Well, that that was good of him, but he was my saving grace because Mm -hmm. he actually rode Mr. Dennis before I took him over and went to the games. Mm -hmm. At the stage we went to Montreal, the games were still amateur and he was a professional rider, so he wasn't able to. So that made it lucky enough for me to get the ride. Mm. And then you you had another horse, Conclusion. Did you ride him all the way through or did you get him later? No, I rode him later too. But in between, I had a horse called McNeil that actually was chosen in the team to go to Moscow in 80. And then, as you know, the government boycotted it. Yes, and then I took him away to England and that for the World Cup final at Birmingham. And he actually won the two opening events at Windsor. And in, in, uh, they have a show there in front of the Queen's residence there. Yes. Windsor Castle. Yep. And he won the two opening events there. He won a Grand Prix at Dublin. But by Los Angeles, he was past it. And um, I'd actually taken another horse over there, Spring Melody. and um, But he didn't climatise and that. So I got the right on conclusion from over there. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Now, you've had a career with horses. What do you think are the key skills for people to start a career with horses? Because a lot of people think that they want to work with horses. A lot don't make it because they don't have the requirements. What do you think are the requirements to start? The requirements are understanding. Uh, We have different youngsters come up here and uh, have a few days. and Understanding that horses are work. Horses are something that can't just be set aside. They're basically like milking cows. They have it twice. You have to feed. You have to do whatever is necessary. You can't just say, oh, no, I want two or three days to do this. You know, Mm. horses are a full-time thing. That's where a lot of our youngsters confuse because they only have one horse and they go to school and parents will feed it in the morning or feed it in the afternoon if they're doing hard. So it's nowhere near the same workload. That's the biggest thing is understanding that they are a full-time operation. Yes, okay. Now, you teach a lot of riders and... I'm sure that every now and then you get quite excited with some young riders that are coming up who can excel in their career and you pick them. But what do you think are the keys to excelling, the keys to becoming good enough to ride at World Championship, to ride at the Olympics, to ride at even a national championship? What do you think they've got above everyone else that starts off? Well, there's a couple of things nowadays that make or break. Unfortunately, We as a country have so many things happen and you get a lot of kids that show form at school but their netball team, they're doing the rowing, they're just doing too much. The thing to succeed in the horse end, as you know, is dedication. Yes. And that's basically it. If you're dedicated, then you go out, you make mistakes, you work on why and how and how to fix them, but you have to be dedicated. Okay, good, good. And hopefully that, you know, helps someone who's considering whether or not they'll go on with it if they've got the dedication, even though they may not be the most talented. Is that what you're saying? You know, a dedicated rider is yeah, going to win over a talented. Your riders are a little bit like different horses that you've probably had to do with it. Something doesn't start with as much as you think, but because you do the work and because they're willing learners, that horse will come through and do the job that you want to do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of riders are like that. They not, may not have. Uh, I've had various ones. I've had some that have just natural ability, but they haven't got the dedication, so it's wasted. And I've got others that will just work their butt off and are improving dramatically because they're just dedicated. As I say, dedication is yep. everything. Yep. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me interrupt to let people know about the horse industry qualifications at onlinehorsecollege.com. If you have a look at the flexible options, there's online theory with practical components that can be completed by video or with a qualified expert in your area. That website again is onlinehorsecollege.com. Thanks. All right. Now you've talked about Art Utendale. What about Anyone else in your career that you think's really influenced you or he was the main one? He was the one that directed to start. I mean, along the way, you've had various people that, you know, when we went away to the Los Angeles Olympics, we were in England and we had Ted Edger and you, you had various ones that actually helped at that stage. But Art was the one that actually changed my direction to the, we can say, the modern style of riding, mm-hmm. which isn't correct in the sense that I've got a video of the 1936 Olympics and they only had a venting then and you had to be in the army and they rode in flat saddles and they rode with the leg as we require it now and all of that thing back then. But because Australia was, you know, down here out of, of, you couldn't watch a big event on TV those days or do anything. All we did was what we saw and so many of our riders, because they moved across to show jumping from the high jumping and they were active throwers and kick legs and all the things that you shouldn't do, Mm -hmm. which made it harder because I had to start off and move up and then had to redo it all again. Yes. And then when you have habits that you have to fix, that is harder work. Mm -hmm. All right. What about now? You've got Mr. Dennis in conclusion. You've talked about a couple of horses. Are there any other horses that we haven't talked about that have influenced you? 
Yeah, I've um, won four Australian championships on four different horses. My first one in 71 was only a youngster and had a horse called Johnny Reb, the coloured or that won at Brisbane. And that sort of started, really started your moving up career. Because I did it for 35 years actually travelling, that, you know, horses came and went and you had to replace and you had to bring. So Mm -hmm. I think I worked out over the time that A and B, which is our our sort of top levels, I had about 50. So it's a lot of horses to keep replacing and probably out of that 50, 40 of them you would have brought through from the start because Mm -hmm. you could do it those days. Yep, yep. What do you think your proudest moment's been? Um, definitely, you'd, you'd have to say um, going to Montreal and, you know, 75 in the class and run fifth in the world from uh, never had at that stage any international experience or, you know, that was going from a boy in the bush to the top end. So mm-hmm. that would have to be by far something that you'd never forget. For sure, for sure. I think uh, quite sensational, really, when you think about your background and how, yeah, what a big step it was and how well you did. Yeah, no, that was one that I'd have to. You, you'll never forget that. And ah, simply being at an Olympic Games is something that nobody can ever describe to you, the feeling of being there and the fact that that was your aim and that's sort of as high as you can get. Uh, to, to get there and you run fifth was, you know, the only thing you could have done was run run fourth, third, second or first. That's the only way you could have done any better. <laughs> yes, yep, yep. All right, now, just thinking back, because you're doing a lot of coaching now, What's a mistake that you see, a common mistake that you see with your riders and something that you teach? The biggest mistake that you watch all the time is simply riders not keeping line. It's the same as you if you talk about your dressage or anything like that, you know. A horse is made to go or jump a fence straight, basically, Mm -hmm. and you see so many riders that just have fences down because they roll round over fences. And that's something that you work a hell of a lot on with your teaching in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to try and make them finish one job at a time before they um, – and you'll see riders that will take off at a fence and they're already looked to the next and that horse will roll around over it because they're asking them to turn and whoop, you know, I forgot I hadn't finished jumping the fence and that's when they'll have it down, just just silly things. Yes, yes. Now, is that a competition mistake? Is there anything you can say to a rider, well, you, you pulled a rail in or you did something that you, your results could have improved? Is it – the rail, the line, yes. or is there something else? In most cases, there's a reason. Mm. You know, in, in, and when I say most cases, sometimes a horse's judgment's just as out and they'll have a fence down. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that it's always. But usually, if you've watched it, there's a reason. The riders have got over keen. You know, riders have got to have, uh, in, in our sport, show jumping end, they've got to have two things. They've either got to be aiming to go to the big time and looking at that picture and working towards that picture, or they've got to be looking to be a pony club and gallop around your events and win and, and don't go anywhere. Okay. You know, so there's two different directions that you look at and looking at the big picture and trying to move up is a slower operation. Mm-hmm. It's like you're doing a dressage if you're wanting to get to your Grand Prix, you know, you get to Prix St. George or something a bit more spectacular, it's going to take you longer. Mm. And you're going to have little ridges in the middle where you have good days and bad days and you've got to keep aiming for that. But if you're only going to do your lower things, then you can just bang, bang, bang and you don't have to put the same work in and you don't have to do any of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, a book. Have you got a book that you would recommend for our listeners? A, A fair few out now, but basically... What has changed over the years is the amount of flat work that you must do on a horse now. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I first started, basically, you got on a horse and if you find them at a jump and they jumped it, they were, it was a Pretty jumper. happy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, because of the technicalities, your flat work is so important. That horse has to work with you and the rider also has to work with that horse. It's a two-way stretch. And... That horse has to be like anything you'd ride to do a dressage or your flat work is that they extend when you ask, they wait when you ask. So that's where, as I say, this work program comes in a lot more. You know, your horse has to be able to do that, plain and simple. They have to be able to uh, bend round a corner. They have to be able to hold a straight line. All of the things that um, you do with your flat work now have to be 
when um, you know, I first started in Pony Club you, and your idea that back those days was basically you did your drill in the morning or your teamwork or your flat work and then you had lunch and in the afternoon we'd do sporting or jump so you could forget all that. Mm. which is the greatest load of rubbish that once you move up in it, you realise that that just can't happen because that morning should have been what carried you through to the afternoon. Yes, yes. yeah. Guy, at the moment, you're not riding and competing, but you're coaching a lot. What do you plan in the future? To keep coaching or you've got something else in mind? What's your, what are you thinking? No, I, no I've got a... Um, uh, very lucky at, at my stage in life that I've got a daughter that's mad on it. Mm-hmm. She's done a very good job and had a lot of success in the sense of getting trips and doing things, so that's kept us going. And I've got some young ones you're teaching that you'd like to take through and you know work with her because you go to comps and be able to do them. And No, basically it'll go through. All I'll do is just keep coaching and getting older. That's about it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, you're doing a great job coaching and you're bringing on some young riders and your daughter's doing really well as, as well. Can you sum up now your philosophy into a lesson? Well, the biggest thing in a lesson is that I try and work with and, it, and uh, also, and, and you would know yourself, is that you know, the problem that we have with a few of our riders and parents at this stage is that they work on the flavour of the month and uh, such and such is coming so they've got to go to them and such and such is coming so they go to them. There's no way if you're chopping and changing that a horse can keep up with it. Mm -hmm. Riders, to me, and I don't care who they go to, but uh, you have to follow something through because that's how you set your horse's mind and even though a rider may be smart enough to chop and change this week and a fortnight later to someone else and someone else, but there's no way a horse can do that. All you'll do is confuse that horse. So what you try to do with a lesson-wise is work your riders through. Any that I have and continually have, you try to put a program together that actually, uh, and, and what you emphasize is the fact that the lesson doesn't do the job. The lesson directs you. It's the work that they do in between lessons that actually brings them on. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, that's, that's good. Good. Guy, how can people contact you? Basically, I'm just a phone person. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll leave that's, those details. That's it. Phone, phone, and um, phone, text. That's that's yeah. Yep. I'm the older generation. <laughs> Look, that's great. They go through emails. They've got to go through my daughter, and, and she organises that in. But but I'm a phone and phone and text, and it's easy. Okay then. We'll leave those details on the website anyway. That's horsechats.com slash Guy Crichton. And thanks very much today for your time, Guy. It's been wonderful talking to you and hopefully it's brought back some memories for you. But I think, you know, Brett, going forward, you're doing a great job coaching our young riders. Okay. Okay. So I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Oh, wait, before you go, if you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, Have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look, horsechats.com. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 